shadow you won't light up mountain you won't climb up coming after me I hate to hate to draw attention to myself <laughs> but it was my birthday this week <laughs> so I just share that with you yeah I turned 50 <laughs> 10 years ago. So I got this card. It's, the, it's one of the best birthday cards I've ever gotten. And I thought it was it, it, this. So, you know, yesterday everybody paid attention to me, showered me with gifts. My wife, who I'm not going to mention in my sermon today at all um, when I preach, made me shepherd's pie. It was so good, it made you cry when you've been in. It was so good. It was, a, it was a great day. So I went to bed, and I, was in a, in a, my, and, and I got some nice gifts too. And I went to bed, and, uh, and then in the night, it was like the Lord was saying, it, you're, it isn't all about you, Ken. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, and, it, and this is what came to my mind. It was like when I'm talking to people, I'm like telling about me and I, and, and it was like ask them, and what about you? It just came to me over and over again. It was like the Lord was saying, and remember to ask people, <laughs> what about you? And that's why it's so cute that I got this card here. Um, it said, once upon a time, a very special person was born who was destined to change the world. <laughs> Calm down, it's not you. It was Jesus. It's got to be one of the best cards I've ever gotten. Rosemary, thank you. That's so awesome. It came with chocolate cookies. Come on now. And she says, it says in the card, and I think he'd want you to have a happy birthday, though. He's like that. So I am getting old. I went to get gas the other day, and I was going to pay cash. And so I, I got out of my car, and it was on 60 on Spring Arbor Road. And I got out of my car. I was going in, and there was a guy standing there. And I go, hey, how are you doing? And he's kind of hard of hearing. He goes, pardon me? I go, how are you doing? Oh, fine. He was like, so I go in, and I pay for my gas, and I'm walking back out. And I think I'm going to talk to the guy again. And I, but I didn't know anything new to say, so I said, how are you doing? He goes, I'm still, still doing good. <laughs> and I thought, that's weird. And I got in my car and I drove away. And then I thought, I, I, for, I forgot to put the gas in it. And so, <laughs> I, so I backed the car up and the guy, and I get out and look at the guy and he goes, you forgot to put gas in your car. And I'm like, I know, I know. I'm old now and <laughs> things are slipping, you know. So, so pray for me. However, I'm still able to preach two or three hours at a time. So don't you worry about me. Do you remember, speaking of memory, do you remember the Jonah story? How many of you, raise your hand, you say, I remember the Jonah story. Raise your hand. All right. Okay. How many of you, I can call you up here and I can quiz you on the Jonah story right now. Who wants to do that? Dale. I see that hand. I did this to Dale yesterday. Who, who, who would like it if I just called you up here right now and I quit Pastor Leo? Uh, you don't get to play this game. No, no, you're, you're an outlier. We don't get to play. No, we're not going to do that. But, but if, imagine that I called you to the platform. Now that I have your attention. If I called you to the platform and I said, tell me the Jonah story. What's it about? I know you would probably get the part, there's a fish in there somewhere. Or you might say there's a whale. Wouldn't be entirely accurate, but you might say that. Jonah got swallowed by a whale, something like that. And then the part about that's so concrete, he got spit up. There, I said it again. Um, you remember that part. A lot of the stuff in this story, though, like the most important part, nobody really knows. And today, we get to chapter 4, which is really the heart of the story. All the other stuff was subpoints. Those were the subpoints. They were important points about God. They're things that we have learned along the way about God in the Jonah story. But we learn all of them so that we can get to Jonah 4. Because the heart of the story is in Jonah 4. Bible scholars taught me this. I think this is a really interesting thing, and I'll pass it on to you. One of the best ways to study the Bible is to figure out what is the key question in any passage of Scripture. What is the key question? The key question that unlocks, the, the question that if you get the answer to it, it unlocks the rich meaning of the book of Jonah, the Jonah story, is this question. Are you ready for this? It's this. Why is it that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? Why is it that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? 
If, you're, if you have heard this taught well, you've always heard it taught that the people from Nineveh, which later became the capital of Assyria, were bad people. And the Assyrians were dangerous bad people. Really good pastors can describe this in such a way that you lose your appetite. I mean, these are bad people that do really bad, unconscionable things. And so it would seem on the surface when the Bible says in the beginning, hey, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh cry out against it, Jonah goes in the opposite direction. That's chapter 1, right? He says, go to Nineveh. This is 500 miles, you know, north and east, up, into the, up toward the Euphrates. He says, go to Nineveh. And Jonah gets on a ship and sails to Tarshish or towards Tarshish, which is probably in the Straits of Gibraltar, out toward uh, the Atlantic, in, yet in the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And he sails into a God-appointed storm. So this, like the worst of all missionaries ever, is told to go to the mission field, and he gets in a ship, and he does the thing. If you imagine the Titanic when he's out on the bow of the ship, he's going, oh, this is great, I'm running from God. And all of a sudden, what is that? A really bad storm. Actually, he wasn't there. He was sleeping in the, remember? And a storm comes. Remember, this a quiz to see if you remember this stuff. And a storm comes, and it's bad. It's actually God appoints a storm. All through this, you see the sovereign hand of God appointing things like storms and fish and, and worms and a scorching east wind. He's, he's arranging things in this story. And then, you know the story, right? Jonah, he's sleeping. They say, you know, get up. We're all calling out to our gods. Why don't you call out to your God? Jonah doesn't call out to his God. They cast lots and discover he's the reason they're in this trouble through some kind of hocus pocus. He's the reason they're in this trouble. These pagans are actually better guys. They're better, they're better Christians, if you will. Than, than, they're better Hebrews. They're, they're better God-fearers than the missionary who won't cry out to God. They're crying out to God. They're like, why don't you cry out to your God? He doesn't cry out. They find out he's the reason they're in trouble. And they very reluctantly toss him overboard. Remember this? This is how the story goes. This is still chapter. They said, we hate to do this to you, you know. Is there, is there any, if there's any other way we could do this, we would do it that way. But it looks like we're going to have to toss you overboard. So they toss him overboard. And then there's this little piece where they all turn to Yahweh and believe and make sacrifices. So this is kind of ironic, right? You've got this disobedient, rebellious, loser missionary dude drowning. And these pagans that he didn't really even sufficiently witness to or pray with. He, they're, they're turning to God, which is a part of the irony of the story. It's supposed to be funny. Everything about it is kind of like, ouch, funny, right? Oh, if this wasn't so pitiful, it would really be funny. Here you have pagans that are acting better than this missionary guy. Then the word of the, okay, oh, that was the part I forgot. And then what happens when Jonah goes down in the water? God saves him with a big sea monster. Right? So the severe mercy sea monster swallows him up, and he's three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. You probably know this, but later on, Jesus, one of the reasons that we believe that this story really happened is because Jesus did. <laughs> he, it's in the Bible there. Jesus refers to it like it's a real story. Jonah is a real person. He's referred to elsewhere in the Bible. And, and so this is why we believe this is a didactic narrative. In other words, it's a narrative made to teach us something. And the question is, what are we supposed to learn then from this didactic narrative, this narrative, this story that's supposed to teach us things? Well, maybe the first thing is when God tells you to do something, do it. That wasn't even that hard to figure out. And the second thing maybe is like, and if you don't do what God says and you run away from him, you might get in trouble. <laughs> you might run into a storm. And, uh, and sometimes the pagans will be more Christian than you are or more Hebrew than you are or more God-fearing than you are. And then, and then you might learn that, and when you do this, God still probably won't abandon you, but he'll still rescue your sorry backside, right? And then, and maybe with a fish, and I can see you taking notes, and I'm going to rescue your sorry backside, yeah, and, and with fish, and, and, and then he prays, he cries out to God. That's another thing you might want to do, even though Jonah, he, you're going to see later on, he, he doesn't want everybody to have mercy, but he wants to have mercy, so he cries out to God. Have you, have you ever met people like that? The only time they do anything religious is when they're in serious trouble, and then they like, they're really religious, they cry out to God. Here's the irony of that. God will often answer that prayer. Even though they're kind of half-hearted, 
even though they're not really ready to obey God, they just want to get out of their trouble. How many of you have discovered that even when you don't have it together yet and you cry out to God because you got yourself in trouble, he answers that prayer. Anybody in the house ever had that experience? Yes. In other words, when you got mercy, you deserved it, right? No, you don't deserve mercy, right? And so this, he cries out to God, and, and in mercy, God has the fish spit him up. And then he says, and then the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. And he says, arise, go to Nineveh, and crowd against her. And then you can see Jonah, you know, okay. And he goes to Nineveh, and he's like, turn or burn. You know, you're going to, 40 days, and I'm going to sit on the hillside over here. I'm going to watch you guys go up like Nagasaki. You know, it's just like, you're going to fry. It's like... Sort of, that's what he says. It's a bit of an embellishment, but that's why you need to read your Bible to see what I'm doing there. Then it's a quiz to see if you're paying attention. So he goes, and then what happens? They, they repent, kind of like the sailors. So in the, there's like two stories, right? The first story, he says, go to Nineveh. Jonah goes the opposite way. God sends a storm. The, the pagans are, are more God-fearing than him. He gives them another opportunity. And he goes this time, and the people repent. And they're like, you know, better natives than the missionary is a missionary, right? The people that repent. And that's when we get to chapter 4. And I wouldn't expect you to know that yet because I haven't taught this to you. And I'm sure you don't read ahead. So, yeah, how, how many of you read ahead? See what I'm saying? Right there. Oh, yeah, lots of you. Sure. You were curious, like, what happened? Well, when God sent a revival to Nineveh, it really got Jonah mad. Can you imagine that? Imagine the missionary visiting, he's got the slides, and he's like, and then they all repented. Oh, it's like ticked about that. It's like, what? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? It says, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And later on, when, when, Jonah's, uh, when Jonah's heart is shown, it's kind of shown in the hyperbole, like the literature of the thing, and, and big, you know, kind of broad strokes. He was really mad. A little bit later on, something's going to happen. And, it's, and when it happens, it's like he really was happy. But when you see what it was that he was really happy about, it's like, oh, my goodness, that's the silliest thing ever. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord, and he said, now this is where we're going to find out why Jonah didn't go to Nineveh. Jonah didn't go to Nineveh. Because he knew that God, it wasn't because he was afraid. Now, it was his primary motivation was because he knew that God was merciful and that he would show mercy to those who repent. And he doesn't want to give judgment. He knew the nature and character of God. Jonah knew the nature and character of God was a desire to show mercy to repentant sinners. And he didn't want the Assyrians to repent because he didn't like them, because he was bitter against them. <laughs> because he had this kind of false nationalistic fervor thing going on. And, and probably because he was just interested in his own selfish comfort. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So he says to God that uh, he prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, is not this what I said when I was in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. I knew you were like this, and that's why I didn't want to go. This is a really crazy motivation, but it's what the Bible says, that they had a conversation earlier that wasn't recorded. I didn't want to do this because I knew you were going to show mercy. Therefore now, O oh Lord, take my life from me, he says. Take my life from me. It's better for me to die than live. So he's so angry that he's despairing of life because he preached and he had this amazing revival. That's just craziness. Um, and he says, I just want to die. And then the Lord asked him a question, which is interesting. There are about maybe three questions. God doesn't preach him a big sermon. He just asked him some very pregnant questions. Like this one, he says, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry? Eugene Peterson passed away his funerals last week. He was the guy that did the message paraphrase, and he wrote a bunch of really good stuff. He wrote a book for pastors about Jonah called Under the Unpredictable Plant. You'll understand that in a minute. In it, here's what he said. It's powerful. He said, when you're angry, something is very wrong. 
And I thought at first, that's not quite right because it's righteous indignation, but he covered himself. He said, when you're angry, always there's something very wrong, either something inside you or something outside you. That's what he said. With Jonah, he got angry because there's something really wrong inside of him. God would have every reason to be angry with Jonah because something really wrong outside. Because, you know, here, here are these people, uh, thousands of these people that, are, that should be receiving mercy. And Jonah doesn't care if they have mercy. Jonah cares if Jonah has mercy. But he doesn't care if the people have mercy. When there's anger, you might want to ask yourself, is there something wrong inside of me? Or you might ask, is, is this righteous indignation because something in, our, in the world is really wrong? And there's a, this, that righteous indignation. Now Jonah, the story goes on in verse 5, went out of the city and he sat to the east of the city and he made a booth for himself and he sat there. He sat under it in the shade that he should see what would become of the city. Remember what was going to become of the, like, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. He preaches, I essentially must just like preach and leave or something and then go. And he's kind of eager to watch the judgment to fall. He's, he's distancing himself from these people. He's not among them. He's not with them. He doesn't consider himself one of them. He, he considers himself superior to them probably. He has that kind of condescending thing like go ahead and then, you know, Thank you for your mercy, but don't give it to them thing going on, right? And, and then it says, so he made a booth. And now the Lord appointed a plant. This is rare, but, you know, the, old, the, the King James Version has a kind of a poetic lilt to it. It, it, it may be, you know, antiquated, maybe, maybe not quite as accurate in places. But every once in a while, you like to reach back in for those things. In the King James, this is called a gourd. It's, that's not necessarily inaccurate. This may be a gourd plant. For poetic reasons, do you mind if I just say gourd every time we talk about this? Because it just makes it sound silly like it ought to sound. So God made a gourd grow up over, a gourd plant grow up over Jonah. God appointed a plant, a gourd, made it come up over Jonah that it might shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So God's saying, well, poor little Jonah, let's make sure that he doesn't get sunburned here. And we're going to give him a little bit of comfort. But you can see there's another motive. So he appointed a plant, a gourd, so that Jonah wouldn't be discomforted. So Jonah was exceeding glad because of the gourd. I love my gourd. This is a nice gourd. This is my favorite gourd. This is the best gourd I've ever had. I like this gourd better than anything. Look at my gourd. This is a gourd. Grow up in a day. Look at back at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. What displeased him exceedingly? That the whole town got saved. And then he got the gourd. And what does it say about the gourd? What does it say? He was exceeding glad because of the gourd. He was exceeding mad because of the repentance and exceeding glad because of the gourd. Now, I know you've never done this. And I've never done this. I've never been more excited about my little worthless thing than all the important things going on in the world. But Jonah did. He was a bad missionary. And the sun rose and God appointed a score. I'm sorry, verse 7. When the dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm. And the worm <laughs> bit the gourd, right? Attacked the plant and it withered. And the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. So see what? God is sovereignly at work in Jonah's life, is he not? Doing what Jonah wouldn't understand. Hey, God is so good to me. He gave me my gourd, and he knows I love my gourd. God is going, <laughs> he does not get it. This is a one, this is a 24-hour gourd. This is for the purpose of afflicting Jonah, not really for the purpose ultimately of comforting him, because he has things to learn, and all the people that are going to read the Jonah story are going to have things to learn. So he appoints a worm to bite the gourd, and then he appoints a scorching east wind to make Jonah really uncomfortable. That makes you go, ooh, he doesn't sound nice. Well, you know, sometimes his mercies are severe, right? And so now Jonah's really upset because all these people repented that he didn't like. And the gourd that he was exceedingly glad about was dead. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. <laughs> he said, here he goes again. This is about the third time Jonah said, I just want to die. Throw me in the sea. Kill me. I mean, anything but... Obey God and be a good missionary, right? And the sun beat down on his head. He said, I want to die. It's better for me to die than live. Now God is going to speak. And God says, do you do well to be angry about the plant? 
Like, Jonah, should you really be that worked up about your gourd? Really? And he says, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. He's talking to God this way. I think it's interesting when people say, I was angry at God. I'm like, that might not be a good idea. He's very powerful. You know, that may not work out well for you. I'm angry at God. Think up another emotion when it comes to God. I just wouldn't go with the angry that much. <laughs> you say, you're joking. That's what the book is doing. The, 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 the whole story of Jonah is satire. It's humor that makes Jonah look ridiculous because Jonah's doing ridiculous things, not obeying God when God is trying to invite him into a great revival, caring about his gourd when he really ought to care about this great city that God wants to show mercy on for his glory. And then he says, and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know their right hand from their left and much cattle. We can spend some time trying to decide what it means they don't know their right hand from their left. There's some interesting, read your study notes on that, some interesting possibilities about that. Let's just leave it right here. It was a great city upon which God wanted to show mercy. And Jonah was much more concerned about his gourd about his little thing. See what happened? Here's a man whose opportunity was to bring mercy to people who need mercy. And instead of bringing per mercy, to, to being an agent of God's mercy to people who desperately needed mercy, he wanted them. He just wanted his gourd. That's all he cared about. What was it that kept Jonah? This is the secondary question. Why didn't Jonah go to Nineveh? Because he knew God would show mercy. Why didn't God, why didn't Jonah want to show mercy? I want to suggest three things, and they're still very much the kinds of things that you and I, that get in the way of mercy, us showing mercy to others. Remember last week's message was God is merciful. Remember how merciful is he? He's very merciful, right? This week's message is how merciful are you? You that received God's mercy, how eager are you to give mercy to others? How quick are you to give mercy to others. God showed you mercy. Is there a group that you should show mercy to? Or is your prejudice in the way? I always show mercy, but they need to read the books I read, dress with the clothes I dress with, be in my income bracket, smell nice. Jim Combs passes a church that has aggressively reached out to needy people. He came to our church one time because he's got a tremendous heart for broken people. He was a little boy and they, they bought a, a church, bought a bus in Waterford years ago. And he was one of the first kids to ride that bus to church. And he had a broken family and a lot of sadness. He's the pastor of the church now. He came and speak at our church. He says, wow. He looked at the church. He says, this is a beautiful church. Isn't it? You know, a beautiful church. You, you can invite people here that don't have problems. Maybe, maybe the people that have never had divorce or people that don't struggle with drug addiction or people that don't have dark, you know, sexual confusion or problems like that. If you could invite a lot of nice people here into this nice building, you'd have a really nice church. And then he said, of course, there aren't many people like that left. Most of us are pretty broken. He said, now, if you would go up and down the streets around here and start inviting broken people, hurting people, needy people, people in need of mercy, now you'd find they're everywhere. See, that's what we're talking about. God pointed, had a city of, of broken people, and he wanted to send a broken, a broken prophet, a broken missionary to a broken city to tell them that God would show mercy. And for some crazy reason, he didn't want to do that. But, I mean, you wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't ever let that get in your way. You wouldn't have, like, a prejudice against other people that would keep you from showing mercy to them, would you? That's something to think about, isn't it? Do you remember the Jesus movement? You heard about it? The Jesus movement out west? Uh, I heard, I think it was Michael Card was doing a teaching the other day, and, and, and he said this. This is his theory. He said there was, during the, during the free love, drug, hippie thing, a lot of really bad things were happening. And, and he said he believes that God's spirit was going to push back against that darkness by sweeping that area with a movement of Jesus people. And that's what he says. And so thousands of people really came to the Lord. There's some weirdness in it, but thousands of people really did come to know the Lord. But it was a little weird. It was a little awkward, right? Churches of nice, churchy people were all sitting in their 
churchy pews to sing their churchy songs with their churchy clothes on. And then some like people that came smelling like weed and their hair was weird and their music was weird and their clothes were weird. Uh, they started getting, uh, turning to Jesus and getting baptized on the beach and so forth. And, and they came to this church. Chuck Smith was a pastor. And they said, can we come in? And a lot of churches were saying, sure, come in. Get yourself cleaned up. Get yourself a suit. Change your weird music. Stop your drugs for six months, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, you can be one of us once you learn the secret handshake. But Chuck Smith felt the Holy Spirit was telling him, just invite him to come in and put him in the band. This is what he did. Literally the first band, the first music group there was made up of a couple of guys who are still walking with the Lord today and who love the Lord. And they said, we were checking into the jail to serve our drug terms, you know, in the jail and checking out for the weekend and singing on the praise stage. Now, I tell you, that would just be a little weird, wouldn't it? You might go sit under your gourd if that happened and say, I want people to get saved that are nice, that people that smell nice, people that are nice, that haven't had weird problems, you know, or that have kept them under wraps like me and are not so apparent. Uh, anyway, I don't want to meddle, right? So it's, that's not the way the story goes. It just lays it kind of lightly on the table. Maybe he didn't go because of prejudice. Maybe he didn't go because of selfishness and, and comfort because he wanted his own little place. And we've got our little place that we call Bittersweet Farm. You know, God, we didn't have that, though, for me to go sit on the porch seven days a week and it should be comfortable. There's a town of lost people all around us. That's why we came here. People who need the Lord. And we need to figure out how to go after them. We're going to tell you some ideas about how to do that. Uh, Tim Mackey, who teaches well on Jonah, he says, this is, the story of Jonah is a little bit like watching a movie. Have you ever watch a movie and then somewhere in the movie, a red dot shows up between someone's eyes and you go, oh no, they're going to shoot that guy. He says, when you get to the end of Jonah, guess where the red dot is? It's between your eyes. Yeah. Are you so interested in your own comfort, your own gourd, that you won't move out? and do something to reach somebody, your neighbor, you pray for them, you do something for them, you participate in a, in a missional team, or, or are you so prejudiced against them because they're not really up to your standard that you want people to get saved, but you're not sure about those people? Or maybe bitterness, and this is a hard one, right? Somebody hurts you bad, hurts your people. That might've been with Jonah, might, might've been the Assyrian people have hurt some people he loved. And he's just like, I will never forgive them. And I don't want them to be forgiven. Maybe that's the case. You know, one of the things that we have always done in this church, we meaning before I was here, they, you all did, was you, maybe, I don't know if you all started this calling teams, using that term teams. We, you know, sometimes churches are full of committees and that's not, that's not as active sounding. In our church, we call them teams. And we have different kinds of teams. And we have service teams, like we have uh, a team of greeters that, that organize themselves, they greet you. We have, you know, worship teams, you know, that sing. We have a prayer team. Uh, we have uh, the, what do they call them, the lawn ranger team. Guys who come and valiantly, like knights, they mow the lawn every Thursday. And they do a great job, make it look like they're a team. And we have an Awana team. We have an amazing Awana program. Are you, are you familiar with this? Do you know right now our, our Awana program is just really, it's really growing right now. And we've been able, because of the generosity of God's people, to waive fees for that. So we're just like, yeah, bring your kids and they can be a part of our Awana. And we're literally, it's growing really fast. Um, and it's blessed of God. You can just see it. Little kids are learning the Bible. I mean, how could that not be good, right? And they come with their little cubby vest in, and they come Wednesday night. This place is just hop, and their teams all over here. There's the praise team that's working in the choir, you know, that's working. There's a Bible study that's going on, and there's a WANA. It's a, it's a big team, and you can still even join that team, but you have to be among the best of our people to get on that team. Like, we will so not let you on that team unless you're one of the best ever. There are those. But, but Paula, come up here. I want you to tell about Paula. Would you? I've asked Paula to come. So Paula Serbach, she grew up in this church. And uh, she and a friend or two, maybe a friend, came with an idea for a team. We're going to have her tell you about that before we go home today. Step right up here. And, uh, and she's going to explain. But while she's talking, here's what I want you to think. I want you to think, who would I show mercy to if my pride and my prejudice and my selfish comfort and my anger and hurt didn't get in my way? She was thinking about that. Tell them the story. You got to, what are we doing here? Let's work. All right. Talk with my hands. This is okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Soul Plant. We here in front of my home at Bethel uh, to present a new team that is forming here at Bethel uh, to serve one meal, one day a week, one breakfast, 
at the Interfaith Shelter in Jackson. Uh, before I tell you a little bit about more about that, let me just introduce myself to you, those that don't know me, and tell you about me. My name is Paula, like Pastor's son. Um, I grew up here, and I'm back here. I'm back home to be an active serving member here at Bethel. It's great to be home. My grandparents served here. My grandfather was a deacon. Uh, friends with Ernie Rorick. I loved my grandparents. I shared a couple stories with Pastor this week. I have really fond memories. You knew my grandparents loved Jesus. It showed. It showed in their ministry. It showed in how they loved me. I loved spending the night with my grandparents. When I would wake up in the morning, I could hear a percolator. I just told my age, didn't I? I could hear the percolator. After the percolator, I could begin to smell coffee and then bacon and breakfast, eggs. You know, shortly after I was called to the table in the kitchen that was set before me, my grandmother served me breakfast. She loved me and I knew she loved the Lord. When I was hungry, she fed me. When I needed clothes, she made them for me. When I was sick, she took care of me. Can you hear the acts of mercy in that? Matthew 25. So, you know, God puts people in our lives, um, strangely puts people in our lives. God gave me Jody Johnson as a friend. Talk about a yin and a yang. Jody is tall and beautiful. I'm short and frumpy. Jody is soft and gentle. I'm kind of loud and obnoxious. But she loves me. She's my sister in Christ, and I love her, and we love the Lord. You know, Jody called me a couple weeks ago, and she said, Hi, Paula. That's kind of how she talks, very gentle. Hi, Paula. I'm so glad to be back at Bethel. So glad to be serving, but I feel like we should do more. Can we pray about it? So I said, okay, let's pray. So we prayed. A couple weeks later, she calls me again. Hi, Paula. So glad that we're serving together at Bethel. Have you thought about it? Have you prayed? I feel like we should be doing more. So I knew Jody wasn't going to give up at this point, so I remembered a mission that my mother introduced me to. And she found out of a need at Jackson County Interfaith Shelter. At the shelter, there are no hot meals served in the morning at all. So those children that stay at the shelter, they're not awakened to the smell of coffee. They're not awakened to the smell of bacon, breakfast. They're not gently coerced into the kitchen. So mother and I would go down, sometimes we would have helpers, and we would go down, we would prepare a meal down there. And we were able to serve, and it was great. So I tell Jody about this, and Jody says, oh, that's it, that's wonderful. We need to tell Bethel, we need to tell everybody at Bethel we need to do this. And I said, great, we should probably include pastor, shouldn't we? She said, yes, you should call him. So I call pastor, we get a meeting, we're in the meeting, we tell pastor all about it. Pastor's like, yeah, this is great. Can you put it on a missional statement? And I said, sure. So we leave Jody's all excited. She said, call me when you put together the missional statement. <laughs> Love her. So I put together this little missional statement. Jody kind of read it over. We presented it back to pastor. Pastor presented it to the deacons. The elders of the church said, yeah, let's do this thing. Let's include Bethel. I said, okay. Pastor's like, yeah, let's do this. Jody's like, yes, let's do this. I said, pastor, have you ever been to the shelter? He said, no. I was on the 
<laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I said, Jody, have you ever been to the shelter? She said, no. I said, okay, guys, let's see where we're going to serve. So I called, I arranged a meeting, we meet down in the parking lot, 9 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. Jody and Pastor are all excited. They're going to go save souls and serve <laughs> breakfast. I said, do you know where we're at? Can we take a minute here? Let me brief you. So I give them the information that I can. Pastor prays with us. There's the doors to the shelter. We head across the road. We open the doors to the shelter. I see people I know. Hey, what's up? How are you? What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, this is great. I haven't seen you in a long time. I turn around and here's Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> Shut with my mouth hanging open like that, will you? He wasn't saying a word, <laughs> honest. I look at Jody and Jody is clinging to her Bible. You can't talk here anymore, you know that, right? I'm done. Just teasing. I'm, not. No, I'm just kidding with you. I'm kidding with you. Go ahead, go ahead. So, but Pastor, the smells yeah. there weren't yeah. the same, were they? Yeah, no. 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 And the people, they were kind of dressed a little different. Yeah. They spoke a different language almost, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was different. It was almost like yeah. we stepped into Nineveh, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was. felt that, didn't you? Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, I felt their anxiety. I felt their fear. Right. So I quickly swept them away into the kitchen of the shelter where we could see the kitchen and we toured and we saw all the foods that we could prepare. We came out of the kitchen feeling pretty good, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, we can do this. Yeah. We'll go home, we'll share it with Bethel, we'll come back yeah. to the kitchen. My girlfriend stops me and she says, don't you want to see the rest of the shelter? Mom, I've never seen the rest of you. So she says, let me show you the toy room of the shelter. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, well, then so we walked into the toy room. It was a big room. There was no toys in the playroom, not one. So she says, would you like to see the men's dorm? I'm like, yeah, let's see the dorm, men, bunk beds, <laughs> college, yeah. Let's see where the men sleep. So we go down the hallway, and I said, how many men sleep? stay here. She said, we have about 32. Yeah. We see this big room and there are some beds, probably about 10. Yeah. There are 32 men there and there are makeshift blankets in the hall. Yeah. Blanket after blanket after blanket after blanket after blanket after blanket after blanket. Some have shoes, some have a pillow. Those are their, that's their home. That's their gourd. Yeah. For 90 days, that's yeah. where they get. That's their home. That's where they have. Yeah. You know, we walked out of that room, I think with a new conviction, Pastor, yeah. don't you? He began to talk. Yeah. He could see conviction. He could see things to bring back to Bethel that I hadn't seen. He saw needs that weren't met that we at Bethel have the opportunity to meet. Mm -hmm. So we left the shelter that day with a different outlook, yeah, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. So we met out in the, in the parking lot. We were talking about it. Pastor was excited. Jody was excited. I was excited. Pastor says, you know, you, you need to present it to the people in a couple weeks. And Jody says, yes, Pastor, I think that. That is what's needed. <laughs> That's very important. And she's going to be out of town. Is that, is that right? right? She's conveniently out of town this week. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what brings me here to you. You see, as a body of believers, yeah. we have yeah. an opportunity to serve Nineveh. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to cross a body of waters. We don't have to be caught up in a storm. We do not have to be swallowed yeah, by yeah. a fish and spit, <laughs> I said it, out. That's right. We don't have yeah, to be. Yeah. You see, as a body of believers, we have the opportunity one day a week to prepare a meal, to set the table, to start the coffee pot, yeah. to serve the homeless. That's a cool idea. The hungry. Yeah. We have that opportunity in the next couple yeah. weeks. It, there's going to be things in the, yeah. in the bulletin, yeah. isn't yeah. there, Pastor? Yeah. And Jody and I will be back in the back. 
We want you to come talk to us. We're excited about Amen. this opportunity. Amen. Isn't that cool? Why don't you thank her? That's it. Bless you. Bless you. God bless you. Let's stand. So, you know, when you open your heart, stand, would you? Everybody? When you open your heart and you say, so who around me could use some mercy? Then maybe the Lord will give you an idea of a simple way that you can extend mercy to others. You know, if you don't let your desire for comfort or your prejudice or your anger or your bitterness get in the way. And as a church, just imagine the kinds of things that God can raise up in missional teams. Even this one, you can be a part of that. Let's pray together and we'll be on our way this week. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the things that we have that make us comfortable. We know that you're not against that. But we also know that they're not the ultimate things. And the ultimate thing is your mission of mercy in the world. And so I pray today as we've gathered in your name and as we've sung uh, the songs of the faith as we've uh, partaken of communion and we've heard of this, this missional team and others that you would, within our hearts, you put a seed, plant a seed in our heart of, Lord, who is it in my life that's hurting and needs mercy? Who is it in my life that's hurt me and needs mercy? Lord, help me eagerly go on a mission of mercy. You're merciful. Make me merciful. Amen and amen. You're dismissed.